boom, here we are. It is Monday. What is it? The seventh. And it is a brand new episode of Let There Be Talk. It will be a solo episode today covering all kinds of stuff. The uh, anniversary of the tragic passing of Tom Petty and Eddie Van Halen. We'll dive into the Oasis North American tour. We're also uh, going to talk where I'm going to talk about the incredible Loof the Goat Porsche show I went to over the weekend and a lot of other things. So thank you for joining me today. And before I even start in to the content, I want to uh, shout out the new Patreoners because I'm telling you, the Patreoners have really, really helped me out over the last 13 years on this podcast. And it really, it really means a lot to me. And there's over 160 something episodes on Patreon. Bonus episodes. I'll let to be talked. Here we go. Troy, no last name. Brand new uh, Patreoner. Oh, no, there it is. Sorry. Troy Paffenberg. <clears throat> yep, that's the uh, silent reflex right there. Uh, whenever you hear that, still battling that. If anybody's got a natural, a natural remedy, let me know because uh, I'm not going to be taking pills all my life. Anyway, back to the Patreoner Cadmus Machupa, DX Ferris, and Joe, just a Joe. And then one more over here, Zane Alafa. Alofkalin, Alofkalin. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining the Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. And also this episode is brought to you by Standard and Strange, my one-stop denim shop. And they are having some uh, great sales right now, standardandstrange.com. You can go to the website, their Instagram, or Go to their shops in Berkeley, New Mexico, and New York City. Neil and Jeremy, tell them I sent you. All right, here we are. We took care of the fucking business. Now we're going to dive into the show. I had an, an extremely busy week. I did, let's see, I did three shows last night. Two at Flappers, one at the Comedy Store. I did... Two on Saturday night, and I think one on Friday night. A lot of shows, uh, working up the new material. Got some uh, some stuff I'm really digging. Tour dates are coming up. St. Louis, I'm going to be out your way for the Flyover Comedy Festival. I'm going to be in Bakersfield, Ojai, Stockton, Fresno, Visalia, and... Um, somewhere else, the I-99 tour with Bill Burr. I'll be headlining at the uh, La Jolla Comedy Store, and New Year's Eve is going to be epic at the uh, Comedy Cellar in Vegas. A lot of good stuff. A lot of good shows. DeanDelRay.com. But anyway, working on all the new stuff. Almost done editing the special. As soon as I finish this, I'm going to look at the second edit and uh, I've, I'm 20 minutes in so far on the second edit. I watched last night and loving it. We're almost there, man. And I got a little surprise for you guys too. Somebody has uh, agreed to do the intro music for the special, which is blowing my mind. So that'll be pretty cool. And then, I'm putting one of my songs, Highway, off of my record, Lone Mountain Serenade, for the outro credits. So a lot of uh, a lot of cool stuff there. A special, it it looks spectacular. I'm telling you, uh, every time I look at it at the edits, I just laugh. I just go, God, this thing is fucking cool. So anyway, just giving you a little uh, update on that. It's coming. It's coming, my friends, and we should probably have a trailer pretty soon. All right. The weekend, lots of stuff. Starting back on Thursday, I got to go uh, see my great, great, long, long good friend, Jacob Dillon, 
uh, playing Los Angeles. The Wallflowers rolled into town. They did something very, very special. On the anniversary of Tom Petty's passing, they played, you're going to love this. Let me get this right here because I want to get this up for you guys. They played the whole bringing down the horse record, the Wallflowers epic, epic record. And then they played in its entirety also Tom Petty's Long After Dark. And it was on the seven-year anniversary of uh, Tom's passing. And man, was it special. I've been a, a, a huge fan of uh, Jacob's music. Most of my life, it's pretty bizarre to think about back in those early days of hanging out at Smalls or Cantor's late night, eating some sandwiches, talking music with Jacob and, you know, the opium den, all these places. Uh, uh, what was the other one? A lot. A lot of jams going down. Oh, the Mint. All these great, great venues back in the day. And, and, and it, it was wild to think about. I was watching Jacob. He's better than ever. His band is fucking fire. I should have got the drummer's name because I feel like a dick for not getting it. But the drummer and bass player and the guitar player, I believe, play with Butch Walker. And then they tracked the record with... Uh, Jacob Butch Walker produced that last uh, record. That's phenomenal. Um, Exit wounds. Anyway, he is sounding better than ever. And you think about this man's career started out. He put the first record out on Virgin records. It doesn't do anything. They get dropped. He keeps going. Interscope signs him. He writes the masterpiece. One headlight. And uh, Sixth Avenue heartache puts together, bring it down the horse. It comes out and it was wild. As I was watching Jacob, I was thinking about those early days when that record came out and you watch your friend fucking just blast off into fame, just to the stratosphere. You, you couldn't get bigger than the wallflowers that year. It was like wallflowers and counting crows all over the radio, all over TV, all over touring. And, uh, you know, here he is all these years later. And I've said it over and over, those dummies that go like, whatever happened to them? Oh, man, it makes my fucking skin crawl. But sold out theater, the Palace downtown, full of true Wallflowers fans that still follow Jacob every record. And I was thinking, that's the career you want. You skyrocketed, but you're still here. You didn't overdose. You're still playing music. And you still got great fans. And you can go out and really do stuff you want to do, like this Tom Petty, Long After Dark, and Bring It Down the Horse Night. Now, when you think about it, the thing I always tell people is, you know, I'm sure people were, you know, they bought this Wallflower CD back in the day. They listened to Sixth Avenue Heartache. They listened to fucking Josephine. They listened to Three Marlenas. They listened to One Headlight. I probably didn't get deep into the back of the record. Maybe they didn't even buy the record. They just loved it like Black Crows. I love She Talks to Angels. Now, look, I've covered this topic over and over and over. So I'm not going to beat a dead horse. But my thing is, that record is a masterpiece. When you get to the back end of it, Angel on My Bike, Invisible City, these deep tracks are mind-boggling. And the reason I'm talking about it is because this Tom Petty record that he chose to play in com uh, complete order is the same type of record and probably the same thing that happened to Tom Petty. Long After Dark has two giant hits on it. It's got, uh, what's got on it? It's got You Got Lucky, huge hit for him, and Change of Heart, huge hit. But when you get into the back half of this record, 
it's really an interesting Tom Petty record because these deep tracks are absolutely fire. A lot like the bringing down the horse record to me, as I started analyzing it, I was going, these are the same type of animals, some big, big radio songs, which is what you really want. And then you hope that people run out and get the record. And then you hope that they sit down and they listen to the back half and fall fully in love with Tom Petty or Jacob Dylan's wildflowers. The back half of long after dark, straight in into darkness, unreal tune, uh, finding out great, great song. And, uh, we should, uh, what was this one? We stand a chance. Can't even read my own writing, but I hadn't listened to those back cuts in years because when I put on Tom Petty, I usually just put it on, on, uh, streaming and let it go wherever it goes. And then of course, for like five years straight, I listened to, uh, the wildflowers record which still is all-time masterpiece tom petty record for me so it was wild to really um to really get into that and you know jacob said something so funny he's like yeah you know we're playing bringing down the horse in sequence and it's uh you know you're kind of fucking yourself because you open up you got sixth avenue heartache and one headlight are the one and two songs. <laughs> so I was like, I always thought that I used to say this, that big bands with the hits like black crows should just come out and play. She talks to angels and hard to handle. And then first, and then those part timers leave. And then the rest of the fans get the deep cuts. But uh, anyway, it was, it was an amazing show. The sound was spectacular at this place, the palace, I had not been there. Old, old theater downtown, downtown. At one point I, I heard from a guy had a, 134 theaters downtown and they're all giant, ornate, beautiful theaters, huge. And just think at one time, every block had theaters down there and they were showing movies and shit. These things hold 2000 people. You know, it's just wild to think about. I talked about it before that that like 2,000 people would go to a movie because nobody's going to movies now. And if they are, it's it's pretty minimal. Speaking of that, you know, Megalopolis came out, which is Francis Ford Coppola's, uh, you know, dream movie, his last movie. He wanted to get this film out and he sold half his winery to uh funded 120 million or something and it only made four million dollars adam driver's in it he's the star nobody wanted to see it which is interesting to think about and then joker i have not seen uh bad reviews like the joker has gotten in a long time the hate on the internet over joker is insane it's passionate hate there's people going out and making full-blown tiktok videos to just trash it mm. Mm. anyway that's pretty fucking wild i want to see the snl film and I'm, i think i'm going to see that tonight monday night after i look over the edits and shit anyway uh did you see joker you know what what a bummer the original Joker is one of the best films in the last 20 years. It is a dark, dark mental illness, semi-serial killer type of taxi driver film. And, uh, and then this one just goes full on, uh, you know, musical. <laughs> oh, man, the, the balls of that. That's what it is, man. That's why sometimes you got to respect the uh, director of like, I'm not putting out Joker 2 just exactly like Joker 1, but just a different twist. I'm going to do something else. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, you know? And uh, look at all those bands over the years that 
refuse to give a, I'm not giving you bringing down the horse part two, you know? Oh, mm. I'm drinking some tea. I'm a fucking, I'm a tea man now. I'm about to be 59 in a few months. And since I can't drink coffee or caffeine or sparkling water, old Dean has turned into a tea man. <laughs> hey man, let me tea bag you. <laughs> Remember that? It was like, they were just like, oh, tea bag, tea bag. Mm. It'd be people running around. He got tea bagged. Anyway, it, uh, I'm a tea man. It's funny. I was going through some photos for the special. And um, I had read something on, you know, the internet where it said you age really hard at 40. Like you look pretty much kind of the same. And then you get to 40 and there's some advanced aging on your looks at 40. And then again at 60. And uh, I was looking at some photos because I'm putting together kind of a cool little photo montage of my career on the credits. And I'm looking over it and it's, it's absolutely true. I'm about to be 59, not 60, but I don't know in the last two years, and I'm sure it has a lot to do with the passing of my mom and COVID and stress of my career, but man, I'm looking at photos like just, you know, three, nah, you know, right pre COVID photos. And then I'm looking at photos now and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I'm fucking old. And it is wild to, you know, I, I, I'm not a guy that goes and gets plastic surgery. I'm not doing any of that shit. You know, let me get my eyebrows jacked up. <laughs> you know, those people, they get the fucking Botox and the eyebrows are Captain, or I mean, Dr. Spock, just, uh, and they got the blown out face. Me and my buddy Steve were out in, uh, in uh, Pacific Palisades yesterday out at the, um, they got like a farmer's market out there. And we thought we'd go out there because it's so fucking hot in LA and you get out by the beach and it's way cooler. So we're out there walking around and these women and dudes are out there in the sunlight and you're seeing them and their faces are fucking jacked. They do not look younger. They look fucking freaky like avatars and their kids are with them. So I started thinking like, do their kids, when they come home from surgery, do their kids go like, mom, he, you don't look like you anymore, <laughs> you know? And they all look the same. There's just this classic mold. It's giant lips, hold back face, lifted eyebrows, weird cheek implants. Ah. And uh, I'm like, nah, I'm not doing any of that shit. But it is interesting when you look at photos in a, only a short period, and then you start to think in your mind, well, wait a minute, I'm eating clean. I'm going to the gym. I uh, I used moisturizer, organic moisturizers. And then it's just like, yeah, man, it's just a fucking, it comes on out of nowhere. And this is when you know you're old is when, well, two things. First of all, I saw Jacob's uh, oldest son is 30 now. I knew Jacob when he didn't have a son. So <laughs> you're like, oh, yeah. But this is when you know you're old. When you see other buddies of you, uh, uh, friends of yours, and you go, man, that guy's looking old. <laughs> you know, he's saying the same thing about you. Man, I saw Dean, he's he fucking looking old, huh? And that's, that's not like a, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's not like some vain thing. It's just wild to see photos and go, oh, yeah, I'm old. So imagine what the industry thinks. They're like, that guy's fucking a fossil. <laughs> mm. I was trying this bit where I was saying, you, you don't want to look old. I'll tell you what you do. You just move into a, a retirement community. Because when I was at my mom's place, 
it was a retirement community and I was uh 50 but 56 or something uh she's coming up on two year anniversary of her passing when I was 56 you know boy did I fucking look young at that gym at the old folks uh retirement community out there at the uh at the uh what's that fucking place you lived in uh yeah the villages man i'm just blocking that out such a tragic tragic memory there at the end but um yeah you want to look young move into a, a retirement community be the youngest one in the retirement community and you'll fucking look good anyway back to what i wanted to get into so thursday was tom petty's seven year uh the anniversary of his passing seven years and then yesterday was four years eddie van halen and then it hit me really fucking hard i go this is really weird i saw tom petty's last show ever it was at the hollywood bowl seven years ago i saw eddie van halen's last show ever at the hall it was at the hollywood bowl and uh, sorry, this cable's fucking on my foot here. They both played their last gigs ever at the Hollywood Bowl. And then they died like three days apart, which I didn't even put together until this weekend. I was like, holy shit, that is weird. They both played their last gigs, Hollywood Bowl. They passed three days apart. They're both monumental icons. So, you know, pour one out for the uh, great Tom Petty and um, Eddie Van Halen, of course. You know how much we fucking love them both. Uh, I will tell you this. I saw something, a vision in my mind that I really hope happens. As, um, as Jacob was playing this Tom Petty record, complete, in order, he told a story about when he went on tour when he was 15 years old, when his dad had the Heartbreakers, they did the Bob Dylan Tom Petty tour. And he spent a summer with Tom Petty and he said how much it really impacted him. And I was thinking, I don't think there'd be anything cooler and no one better to do it then next summer, a celebration of Tom Petty by uh, having Jacob Dylan front the Heartbreakers. Now, they're getting older, so I think it's time to do it. One last run for those great, great, great musicians to let people see and hear those songs and let that band play again with Jacob fronting it. It, that way, it wouldn't be like, oh, what are they doing? This would be a full circle. Jacob spent a summer with them when he was 15 years old, out on tour. And now here they are, one last tour, playing and celebrating the great Tom Petty and celebrating, let's be honest, the Heartbreakers. Mike Campbell, Ron Blair, uh, you know, Ben Montench, who is fucking a god. I... I I can't say Stan Lynch because he probably wouldn't be there, but man, that would be insane. Stan Lynch. Anyway, put that in your fucking, your, put that in your noggin. I'm going to start using old man words like noggin. He was spinning yarn, you know, putting stuff in my noggin. <laughs> I got reflux. Fucking. I was talking to this doctor and I go, yeah, man, you know, this reflex sucks. And he goes, yeah, getting old. You know, we're actually not supposed to live this long. So the longer you live, the more shit that fucking happens to you. He, he just said that to me in the doctor's office. We're not supposed to live this long. Oh, my God. Anyway, what do you think? Tom Petty, uh, you know just celebrated by the Heartbreakers and Jacob Dylan out there all summer. God, that'd be great. Oh, man. 
I'll tell you, uh, let's see what else I got on the menu for you boys here. Oh, fuck, Saturday. So I've been, uh, I've been a Porsche guy since the sixth grade. My sixth grade teacher, Miss Foster, bought a, a root beer brown 70s Targa, 911 Targa. And from that day on, I've loved those cars. I think it's the best car ever made. And uh, it's funny because I remember one time when I was interviewing Les Claypool, I said, are you a Porsche guy? And he, he said some joke. I can't remember what it was, but he was clowning Porsche owners. And I thought about it and I was like, well, there's a stigma of that old school Porsche owner, which would have been like doctors, uh, Coke dealers, lawyers. But now when you really think about all these years later of the uh, legacy of Porsche 911 air-cooled cars, it's really the type of people I enjoy being around as I get older. People that aren't animals, you know, they maybe read, like good music. They're into architecture, fine timepieces. And I'm not talking about rich people. I'm talking about most people that I know that own a air-cooled 911, other than the Seinfelds and those guys, are people that wanted them all their life. And they saved up. They did whatever they could do. They got an old used one and maybe got it restored. And it's in their blood. And they love them. So Saturday was the 10-year anniversary. And I'm going to say the name of the show. And I'm sure I fuck it up because I always do. Luftigel, which is a gathering of air-cooled Porsches from the 356s all the way to the end of the air cooled, the 993 era. And they've only done it one time before on the back lots of Universal Studios. And it was hands down one of the greatest events I had ever been to. And that was, I think, like five years ago or something. And it was spectacular so i always was like god i wish they would do it again there they don't do it in the same spot every year they pick different states different countries different uh locations like one year it was in a lumber yard here in la uh another year it was uh in some weird place in san uh in marina del rey but they announced they were going to do the 10 year at Universal Studios backlot, and I was fucking so fired up. So it was Saturday. I got up at 6.30 in the morning. Me and my buddy Steve and Greg went. Rockline Greg. And it's on the backlot. There's photos and videos on my Instagram. So, you know, the cars are around the New York streets or the Chicago streets or the Leave it to Beaver neighborhood or the, the Mexico Flash flood streets. Have you been to on the uh, Universal tour? You know that flash floods. It's uh, it's on the corner of Jaws. There's Psycho House out there, and there's an old weird uh, section that looks like Paris, France, and these cars. I would say over a thousand. I could be wrong, but it felt like over a thousand, and these people. They're all in these different sections and they gather and they hang and they celebrate. And it is spectacular. I'm telling you, if you get a chance to go to one of these gatherings, even if it's just a small gathering, like here in LA at the last Sunday of every month, they have comedy or uh, cars and coffee at Griffith park free. Sunday, last Sunday, uh, I think it's like 7 a.m. to 11. Even if it's a small one like that, you get out there and you get into this car community and it's just fantastic. So this show had some of the greatest cars I've ever seen. And I don't, 
I, I, I don't think I've seen this many incredible weird colored Porsches. I like the weird ones, the Ruby that looks pink. I like the mint that looks like mint chocolate chip ice cream. I like the chalk colored off white kind of bone. I like the weird non-metallic ones where they're just kind of muted blues and oranges and, and mustards and with weird names like, uh, you know, cashmere beige and ruby stone. Hold on. I got some of the names here. Here we go. I, I saved a lot of them because the names of the colors are fucking insane. Okay, here we go. Ruby Stone. Uh, this one was called, what's this one? So they got a little uh, QR code on the car and you can scan it and then it pops up and tells you everything about the car. Like here's a 1966, that was the year I was born. Bahama Yellow, all right? And then it'll just give you the history. My 911 is an early production, 66 Coupe, originally sold through the storied Vasek Polek Porsche in Manhattan Beach, April of 66. Everybody has the history of their cars. I love this. Over its 58-year life, which is my age, it has had eight owners, and it has resided entirely in Southern California, accumulated over 238,000 miles on the chassis and gone through three engines. We are the eighth and longest owner. My wife purchased the car just out of college in 84. That's when I fucking graduated as a replacement for her broke down hand-me-down VW van. Her parents gave her. It was a case of, I need a car right now. And a friend of hers at work said they knew a local high school teacher who was selling a car and she should look into it, which by the way, there it is again, local high school teacher. My sixth grade teacher had it. Now, I don't know what the cars uh, cost back then. I should have looked uh, maybe in the seventies. Um, but or did the teachers make more money back then? Like a high school teacher and an elementary school teacher with Porsches, man. Okay. <clears throat> so um, let's see. Two phone calls later, one to the seller and one to the bank for a loan. She was standing in front of the car with a smile on her face and the keys and the pink slip in her hand. It became her daily driver until well after we were married in 93 and the arrival of our two children, which, um, so we had to add an SUV to the garage. Though on numerous occasions, it still served as the grocery getter and kid hauler from school and events on the weekends. This is insane. So this goes on and on and on. I'm not going to keep reading it for you, but my point is everybody was out there. They got their cars and you scan these and you, you get to learn about their car and their color. Here's one that um, Steve and I loved, and we saw it in my neighborhood yesterday, Peru Red, 1983, Peru Red 911. Never heard of that color. All the colors have weird names. Like, uh, here's one. It is um, Hellgelb. What the hell is Hellgelb? <clears throat> anyway, do yourself a favor. Follow these guys on Instagram. Let me get the uh, spelling for you. Loof. Most people call it Loof because they can't say it either. Loof the goat. Uh, here's how you spell it. L-U-G-T. Sorry. L-U-F-T-G-E-K-U-H-I-T. L-U-F-T-G-E-K-U-H-I-T. H L T. I have a hard time even saying the spelling when I'm fucking looking at it. Who puts these letters together? F T G. Right. Anyway, follow them. Uh, looks like they got another event coming up. They have small events all over, but this, this event at universal studios is unreal. They got cool t-shirts too. If you want to get one.
So, uh, of course, I got the fucking Porsche fever. You know, I'm always like, how can I fucking get one? <laughs> you know? And then the market's down 30% right now. Everything's down. Nobody's buying shit. I was talking to a guy yesterday. He goes, you know, I was at this open house. I love to go to open houses on the weekend. I went to this beautiful fucking mid-century waffle line roof house that was just beautiful terrazzo floors. This thing was, it was stellar. Just open houses on Sunday with Gertie. Nothing better. Mm. Anyway, and I was talking to this guy and he goes, yeah, nothing's selling. People are freaking out over the election. The, uh, the you know, inflation's through the roof. Groceries cost a zillion dollars. All the luxury goods, like Louis Vuitton, all that shit is way down. And, um, and Porsches are down 30%. Ferrari has cars sitting on the lots. I just read. They have like six months worth of cars on the lots. Not good. Not good. You can say whatever you want. Oh, yeah, it's the Libertards. Hell, yeah. Uh, but no, it doesn't matter, like I said, who you vote for. It's just fucking, it's just freak show right now. We had COVID. Everybody got out. They were going crazy and having a good time. And now it's like, oh, shit, my credit cards are stacked. Which, by the way, I'm going to go see uh, Rival Sons and Clutch tomorrow night. I keep saying I'm done with my concerts. But in the next couple months, some of the best shows on the planet are coming. And I am still angry at myself. I made a rare, rare mistake. By not going and seeing Kings of Lean on a couple weeks ago, I went to the Mastodon Mastodon show, and uh, it was just a complete nightmare with the guest list, and I didn't have any fucking fun. It was a total bummer. And then Kings of Leon was playing the next night, and I was like, I can't take two nights off. I'm getting ready to shoot my special. No fucking way am I taking two nights off. And I chose the Mastodon night, and it was a bad, bad move. I shouldn't have done it. I should have went to Kings of Leon. I, I haven't seen him in years. I've seen Mastodon like five times in the last six years. I hadn't seen Kings of Leon in years. And I've been watching their uh, clips on Instagram. If you don't follow them, follow them. Man, they're putting up these pro clips. And I don't think they've sounded better ever. And the band, I've been watching these interviews and Caleb and the guys are saying they're, they're like in this great space uh, in their mind. There's a great clip on there where they're reading all the bad reviews from fans, quote unquote fans of their new record. I love it, man. They're just on there like, Oh, Kings of Leon. They're fucking soft now. Oh, I waited three years for this dud. Kings of Leon hasn't mattered since their first record. They're reading them all in a room backstage. And, uh, you know, there is that thing. Don't read the comments, but, there is also that thing of, uh, you know, I think that new record's good, like really good. And I think that, you know, uh, a band to be around this long, still the original members, the three brothers and the cousin, still making music, didn't OD. If you saw that documentary, they were fucking lunatics. Nobody died in a car crash, nothing. And they're out just, oh, oh, and they look fucking great. The bass player, first time I saw the bass player was on the EP at the Viper Room. And the bass player was like 16. It was just this kind of chunky, chunky kid drinking Jack Daniels and playing a, like a Firebird bass. Bass player, first of all, is fucking fantastic. And he looks amazing, man. He looks like he could easily be like Brad Pitt's brother. <laughs> anyway, I am really bummed I didn't see uh, Kings of Leon. I just went on their website just now. I said, fuck it, I'm going to fly somewhere and go see them. And tonight's their last night of their tour. They're in Boston, so I can't do that. But I hope that they come back around maybe in the next part of the year. I'm sure they will. Every fucking band has to stay on the road now. Metallica just... Uh, announced more dates in 2025. 
third year into their uh, 72 seasons rec uh, tour, which is wild, man. These bands are just out forever because they need to, uh, it's, you know, there's no record sales or anything, so they need to stay out there. Gertie is snoring like crazy. She always snores when I'm doing the podcast. Is that some kind of fucking sign? <laughs> uh, I do want to say this. Um, I saw that. Um, I saw that. Hold on. Let me look here. I saw the uh, Sturgill Simpson concert. Remember, I was talking about it a couple weeks ago. And I do want to say this. That concert has been sitting in my heart for over two weeks now, I can't get it out of my fucking head how great it was. And and they're getting all these rave reviews. They're out playing three hours. They're throwing in dead songs now. They're throwing in Prince Purple Rain still. They're doing Eagles songs. They're doing Sturgill songs. They're doing Willie Nelson. It's like a, a celebration of music, man, this tour. It is fantastic. Get out there while you can. All right. Um, Oasis announced their uh, North American tour and Richard Ashcroft is the fucking owner. Talk about opener, not the owner. Talk about a head exploder. Ashcroft and the Oasis, the Oasis <laughs> together. Got to see that. Ashcroft has always been one of my favorite rock stars and musicians ever. And his solo albums and that fucking, uh, you know, um, Urban Hymns record. I mean, that guy is insane. And think about that era of Oasis, Verve, Blur, all of that. Oh, my God. So uh, that's going to be amazing. Sold out immediately. I think it's three states. I think it's like Chicago, Jersey, and L.A. Uh, Rose Bowl, two nights. Instantly sold out. My buddy Joey still couldn't get tickets. I was like, How's that, how's that even possible? That Ticketmaster, I, you know, it seems like every year or so I hear that the, the government's going after Ticketmaster. You know, Taylor Swift fans are suing Ticketmaster. Uh, there's a monopoly by Ticketmaster and Live Nation, and then it just goes away. What Like, what happens? It's, it's just fucking insane. I can't even imagine growing up as a, a young person in your teens wanting to go to shows and dealing with this fucking bullshit. I miss the old school sleeping bag all night in front of Tower Records, waiting for it to open, get in there, go to the Bass Tickets and get your ticket. Hard ticket in hand. And this isn't old man shit. This is just fair. They stayed the night in line. They got the tickets. And if you wanted a scalp, you had to stay the night in line or you paid people. That's what they used to do. They'd pay people to stay the night in line. I always tripped on that. Like if I was staying the night and a scalper was paying me and I got the tickets, I'd be like, oh, nah, I'm going to sell them. You're not paying me enough what you're making. I'll just say, you know, but man, it is tragic. It is tragic. What's going on out there. And, uh, it has soured the concert industry to just to the just the bottom the $75 parking the $30 beers the you know resale ticket prices it's a bummer it really is a bummer and as much as people oasis i think their tickets were fucking some ridiculously cheap great price and of course they sold out in a minute oasis being fucking cool they're like do not fucking buying a secondary market or what you know and uh and here we are i'm sure they'll add some more shows you know those fucking shows sold great i saw oasis on like one of their last tours and 
it wasn't even sold out. America didn't give a fuck about Oasis. I'm telling you, I saw them at Santa Barbara Bowl uh, with the Black Crows. I saw them, I've saw them three times and it was never sold out. You know, early on it was sold out. That original uh, Definitely Maybe and Champagne Supernova era of the 94, 95. But in the 2000s, where were you? Where were you in the 2000s? I was there. I still fucking think one of the great, great, great Oasis records is uh, Don't Believe the Truth. I talk about this record and people just look at me like I'm talking about fucking broccoli. You know? 2005, it came out 11 years after they started. Go listen to that record. I think it's better than 95% of their material. That deep, 11 years later in their career, that band they had, I saw it. They were fucking, they were mean and lean. Opens up the record, Turn Up the Sun, and then uh, Mucky Fingers, uh, Love Like a Bomb. I mean, the first five songs are just fucking, as the kids would say, bangers. These are just bangers, mate. They're fucking one, two, three, four, five bangers. Turn up the sun. Unreal. Don't believe the truth. Unreal fucking record. I listened to it yesterday. I was like, this fucking record. I don't listen to the first Oasis record at all. Second one I love. I love the first one, but I burned out on it. Second one, of course, all over the radio. But man, don't believe the truth. What a fucking record. And that other one, what was that other one called with the car and the fucking pool? I like that one too. Hold on. Let me see what that was called. Um, <clears throat> don't believe the truth here. Uh, be here now in 97. That's a fucking good record. These guys fucking kill. Standing on the shoulder of giants. Remember that? All the records are great, but man, don't believe the truth. I think is. Probably my favorite Oasis record. I'm one of those guys. I go fucking, I go sideways on your ass. All right, I think I'm almost out of here, man. My fucking voice is trashed. It's just trashed. Dude, your voice is trashed. Um, yeah, that looks like uh, that looks like it. Talk to oh, one last thing. Omega watches. Omega dropped a. Fucking masterpiece of a watch on Friday. They dropped the Speedmaster of all Speedmasters. The one, the first Omega in space. Uh, F-O-I-S, they call it. And it was the, before they walked on the moon with the Ed White and all those, you know, they had, they flew around the moon and Omega was there. And it's the Speedmaster with the pointy uh, sword hands or arrow hands, whatever you want to call it. And uh, had the Hesalite dome. And they had some, uh, some prototypes that had a kind of a blue black dial. And then it had the lollipop long hand. And so they dropped this watch on friday that is exact to the vintage one even the markers are patinaed to look old it's got the octopus on the back 62 what is that uh, 2004 the anniversary let me look at that real quick and it's 39 millimeter the ultimate fucking watch size and you know they a couple years ago they put out the ed white uh reissue with the 321 movement and it was exact and it was 39 millimeter but it was 15 grand and this watch i'm gonna have to say i think this watch kills it and it's 7900 and it is fucking amazing hold on let me get this here it just it really really fucking hurts me this way you can go on their um, Instagram and see it. Yep. October 3rd, 1962.
full anniversary model. First Omega in space. It is beautiful. Flat link band, super comfortable. And then the Hesselite was the domed crystal that like when I got Mirror in his Omega, he was like, I got to return this because he had bang it. And the, the Hesselite is plastic and it would scratch. He's all, who the fuck could, who the fuck could have this fucking bullshit fucking scratched up. And Marin trashed anything he gets. He, he had a car one day and he left it on and it drove into his wall at his house. He gets a guitar, he drops it. Oh, I broke the headstock. <laughs> you know, those people, they just fucking break or, or they're always spilling on their self or they spill at your house. I got this friend comes over, always spilling in my house. Spills. Fucking nuts. Anyway, so they created for this reissue a scratchless, you know, scratch proof crystal in the shape of the fucking dome. And it says right here, uh, first time ever Omega has used a brand new domed sapphire crystal that replicates the form of Hesselite glass. It is beautiful, this watch. Oh my God. Christmas is coming. Somebody put it under my tree. <laughs> anyway, what I want to say about this is Omega and Tudor are very, very smart. They're giving the people what they want. They're mining their history. They are giving you the ultimate vintage feel and look, but a new watch so it's not so fragile. It's something I've said for years that Harley Davidson should do. I've said this for at least 20 years. Harley Davidson should reissue the Harley FXR but with all new technology, but it's the FXR and they should reissue the Harley knucklehead. And it's a knucklehead motor and motorcycle Harley, but it's all the new technology, ABS brakes. That's what this Omega is. It's a 62 Omega, but with new, you know, water sealed, uh, gaskets, new movement, uh, you know, new fucking technology. So you get that classic fucking thing. Like if Porsche, you know, ever changed the look of the 911, people would go crazy. Porsche is the kings of constantly giving you the 911 fucking body shape. Of course, it's, you know, beefier and meaner or whatever, but it's still that fucking body shape. When you hit a home run in life with design and people love it, give them what they want, man. It's so hard to hit a home run that when you hit a home run, keep hitting the home run if you can. Unless you're the fucking, you know, Dodgers Padres and you're just out there trash fans throwing fucking baseballs and shit. Don't fucking hit those home runs. <laughs> fucking nuts out there. MLB. B stands for beer. Fucking insane. Major League beer drunkers. Anyway, go check out this new Omega for you watch freaks out there. And I know those watch freaks because you guys really liked the uh the last episode i did with dan spitz and i fucking enjoyed it myself too so that was pretty fucking cool to see the response tour dates deandelray.com please come out and see me live get ready for the special and uh patreon.com slash dean del ray and i'm gonna ask you one more time if you've made it all the way through this show please leave a review on my iTunes. It's been a long time. The last review I saw on there was from August. If, if half of you left a review, it would just explode the, the show up into the top charts. And subscribe to my YouTube, Dean Del Rey. Fucking great video versions like this one here. And uh, it really helps. Okay, see you out there on the road, my friends. And uh, thank you. 
for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk.